In this video, we'll look at C4 chemical patterns, and in this topic, there are four main strands. The first one is looking at the periodic table. The second one is looking at ionic bonding. The third one we're going to look at is the group 1 elements. And the fourth one is looking at the group 7 elements. So the periodic table um, in the spec has four main points. The first one is spectroscopy. The next one is interpreting the periodic table. The third one is the development of the table. And the last one is the electronic configurations of elements using the table. So let's look at interpreting the table first of all. You see here that carbon has two numbers on the table. The first one is the REM, or relative atomic mass. The second one is the proton number. And the electrons in an, an atom are the same as a proton number, presuming that the atom is neutral. If the atom is an ion, or non-neutral, then they could be different numbers. Now going across um, the table, you're looking at periods. And if you go up and down the table, you're looking at groups. And there are eight main groups in the table, not counting the D block. Now, when looking at the atomic structure of an atom, we look at the three components of the atom, which I'm drawing for you now. There are um, the blue ones, that are positive charges, called protons. The neutral components are called neutrons. And the negative components are called electrons. Now, I'm drawing a line there to show you that the periodic table is arranged by relative atomic mass, and as you go across a period, the proton number increases by one. So, Dobina, Newlands, and Mendeleev were the three main people that developed the periodic table to what it is today. So let's look at Dobina first of all. Dobina came up with the idea of triads, which were patterns in groups of three. Now he noticed if you took the average relative atomic mass of three similar elements, um, then it would be the same as the middle element in that triad. Now it didn't work for all elements, he found, and because of that, it was quite largely ignored. Now Newlands identified octaves, which were groups of eight elements, and every eighth element had similar properties. He arranged his table by um, relative atomic mass, and it was good, but it didn't work for all elements. But more embarrassingly, new elements were being discovered um, and kind of skewing his table and making it um, incorrect. So he was rejected by scientists as well. Now Mendeleev um, also arranged by relative atomic mass. He also left gaps in the table um, where he said there would be new discoveries that he hadn't discovered yet. And he also predicted the properties of those um, elements too. So let's look at electronic configuration. So, in the first shell of an orbital, we can hold two electrons. In the second shell, eight electrons can be held. And in the third shell, the green shell there, another eight can be held too. So it goes two, eight, eight. Now, I'm linking in the idea of proton number as we said earlier, an uncharged atom has the same electrons as protons. So for carbon, there are six protons and therefore six electrons, two in the first shell and the remaining four in the second shell. And you should always fill it inside out. So spectroscopy relies on um, the fact that some different elements produce different coloured flames. Now, not all elements um, produce different flames. Um, some of them produce the same colour. However, if you then refract those colours to get what we call spectra, or lines showing the wavelengths of the light emitted, um, each different element has a unique spectra. So there we show mixture X, element A, element B, and element C, and we're trying to find out which of those three elements are found in the mixture. So we can quite clearly see that element A and element B are found in the mixture because the lines of the spectra 
match with mixture X, but element C does not. So mixture X contains element A and B and an other mixture. And I'm drawing a line to Mendeleev to show you that his discoveries relied on spectroscopy. So, let's look at group 1 now. We're going to look at reactivity of group 1 elements and reactions of group 1 elements. So, we should know that group 1 is reactive with oxygen, it's reactive with chlorine, and it's also reactive with cold water. So let's look at what happens with the reaction of group 1 elements and oxygen. So first of all, in moist air, uh, lithium, sodium, potassium all tarnish, or change from a shiny colour to a dull colour, and this happens more in the lower down um, elements such as potassium. In water, lithium fizzes, sodium gives violent fizzing, and potassium gives a purple flame. Um, and the reaction can be shown as the uh, metal plus water goes to the metal hydroxide plus hydrogen. Um, state symbols and balancing is important for marks. And if you put universal indicator inside the water afterwards, we see it turns blue, showing the sodium hydroxide is an alkali. Um, again, the reaction increases as you go down the group. The last one shows that you get a, a colourless crystalline solid when chlorine and group 1 metals react. Um, and it forms a formula MCL, where M could be lithium, sodium, potassium. And that equation there shows you a balanced version of how sodium reacts with chlorine. And keep in mind that the 2 is there because chlorine is diatomic. It's a non-metal that joins to itself in so now let's look at the uh, reactivity of group 1 elements. Lithium, sodium, potassium all have one electron on the outside shell, and that shows you the configuration. However, you should notice that the electron on the outside shell of potassium is far further away from the nucleus, or the positive charges, than in lithium. And therefore, as you go from lithium to sodium potassium, the electrostatic bond gets weaker and weaker between the electrons that are negative and the positive protons and therefore it's easier to pull away an electron and therefore the reactivity increases down the group. Now we're going to look at group 7 now and the same thing we'll look at reactivity but also properties of the group 7 elements and displacement reactions. So if I look at um, fluorine the same pattern we've got seven electrons in the outside shell now chlorine also has seven and bromine has seven, and those seven electrons on the outside shell get further from the nucleus, again giving it a weaker electrostatic force or bond. However, this time they're not trying to lose electrons, they're trying to gain electrons, and it's harder to gain electrons when the outer shell is further from the nucleus because the electrostatic bond is weaker and therefore electrons don't, don't join as much. So it becomes less reactive down the group as opposed to in group one. So it's opposite. So properties now. We've got fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, all diatomic. And fluorine forms a PAL yellow gas at room temperature. Chlorine has a green gas at room temperature. Bromine is a reddy brown liquid at room temperature. And iodine is a grey solid. So you see that the uh, density increases as they go from um, gas to solid. And the colour gets darker as well as you go down the group. Um, iodine forms a purple gas. Bromine forms a reddy orange gas as well. And this table is, is being drawn to show you displacement reactions of salts such as potassium chloride, potassium bromide and so on with aqueous versions of the group 7 elements, chlorine, bromine, iodine. And we see that chlorine displaces the uh, bromide and iodide ions in the salt. Bromine displaces the, bro the iodide ion in the salt. And therefore we can say that chlorine is the most reactive followed by bromine, followed by iodine. So, ionic bonding now. If I draw you the outer shell of a sodium, one electron, and chlorine, seven electrons, the sodium loses an electron and the chlorine gains one, so they both have a full outer shell. But because the sodium has lost an electron and chlorine's gained one, the sodium becomes positive, chlorine becomes negative, and there's an electrostatic force between the two oppositely charged ions, which means they come together. And this happens for millions of sodium and chloride ions, forming a giant ionic lattice or a repeating pattern where every sodium is joined to six chlorines and that explains the high melting points and boiling points. Thank you for watching.